Uh, I'm Tanya King, I'm Service Improvement Manager at the Trust. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've actually done and talk about some of the results that we've got. So my bit of the talk is going to be about focusing on demand to get out of the hospital. Why focus on demand to get out? Well, if you work in healthcare, I'm hoping that this, um, this book is familiar to you. It's called Making Hospitals Work. It's produced by the Lean Enterprise Academy, written by Mark and Ian. And when I first read this a couple of years ago, it made the biggest lot of sense that I'd read in a long, long time in applying lean principles into healthcare. And basically, the work that we are doing is just going through the book, actually, uh, with a lot of help from our friends at LEA. And as Mark said, when we started to look at what our problem was, our problem is very much like Middleton General's problem. Um, and we do have problems with meeting our A&E targets. We have problems with length of stay. We've obviously got problems around cost and financial issues, healthcare-acquired infections, and access problems. And funneling those downs and look down and looking at the impact of doing some work in one on the other led us to the belief that we needed to focus on length of stay. And this is our baseline length of stay looking back a couple of years ago and as at the end of uh, December 2009 we were looking at an average for our medical patients excluding those patients who were having rehab of 6.1 days. So this is the baseline that we're starting from. So where did we start? Now, I've put this slide in because from my point of view, I've been in service, service improvement for probably seven or eight years now and been interested in lean principles for maybe six or seven of those years. And I think I was very much in a place where you look at your current state and then you look at your future state and you work towards your future state from your current state. And I think I always knew in the back of my mind that before you do anything, you should really start looking at achieving some stability in your operational <coughs> management before you move on. You know, it's like trying to build a house with no foundations. It's not going to work, is it? But I think what we tended to do was move straight from current state to future state. And what I've learned that we needed to do is to, first of all, achieve some operational stability. And the work that we've been doing since then is all about just that. And like Dan says, in, in the NHS, I don't think we realise this, but we, don't, we didn't do operational management. It was something that we just didn't do. So we're having to learn how to do that. And it, it is a bit of a struggle, but we're getting there. And the way we've done this is through what we call visual hospital and plan for every patient, which have come out of the book. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about both and tell you about the results that we've been achieving. So why then are we focusing on demand to get out? Most of the targets that we have to achieve um, are front-end targets. They're about getting people into A&E, getting people in for elective, either outpatients or inpatients. We tend to focus on the front end, trying to get people in, because we're focusing on the, on the targets. However, if we're not discharging people properly, if, if discharges are not working properly, it makes sense that you're going to clog the system up so you can't get people in. So why focus on the front end? You actually need to be getting them out of the back. Most of the time... Most days, the demand to get in, i.e. the number of admissions that are needed, matches the demand to get out, the, de the number of discharges that we have most of the time. The problem we have, for those of you who don't work in healthcare, is that most discharges happen later in the day, but yet people want to come in at, at intervals spread out throughout the day. So you can see where the problems are, might be. So, a little bit about visual hospital. This is about operational management of patient flow. It's about managing patients hour by hour and knowing what's going on. Um, so that we know what the demand is for beds, we know what beds are available, and that those are visual and they're, they're clear. And once that's there, we can take action to make sure that the demand is filled. The plan here in a hospital is to fill empty beds, leaving your assessment areas with the empty beds in order to take admissions. 
And what we can see with visual hospital also, we can see at a glance if patients are what we call off-template or outliers. So if for some reason we've had to put them in the wrong place, if we've put a medical patient in a surgical ward or vice versa, or we've put somebody in a ward that's the wrong specialty for them, what we know is that their length of stay will be extended if we don't get them back to the right place. So we can immediately see where these people are and we can take action, if we can, to get them back into the right place. And another important thing about visual hospital is that we can, dele- we can deal with what we call delayed discharges. These are people who are medically fit to move on to their next destination, which may or may not be home. But we, they're not going anywhere because they're waiting for something, they're delayed. And what we found is that we've uncovered these patients, we know exactly who they are, and our patient flow team can help the wards to work on moving these patients forward and getting them to their next destination. Because what happens on wards is the ward staff get caught up in the daily routine of looking after patients' daily needs, whether it be treating them, whether it be washing them, dressing them, feeding them, giving them medications. The things that get left are the things like ringing social services, ringing um, a nursing home to see when they're going to come and assess somebody. And this is where the patient flow team can now help move these patients along. So these are the symbols that we ask the wards to, um, to display for each of the patients on their wards. We don't need to know the name. All we need to know is what status has the patient got. If they're being discharged today, they're a green square. If they're medically unfit, still are going nowhere, they're a red square. If we think they're going home, they're a question mark. Um, If they're one of the delayed patients who are ready to move on, they're a green cross. Off-template patients and outliers have their own symbols too. Empty beds, booked beds, etc., etc. And that's all we ask the wards to do. We ask them... (coughs) them to display this information on their ward area and keep it up to date. And then the patient flow team go round the wards on a two-hourly basis and pick up this information and take it back to the patient flow office. And this is our very high-tech visual hospital. It's a couple of pieces of perspex um, with some um, paper down the back of it with, with the layout of the wards. Um, So the patient flow team come back with their information and they just populate this perspex. So what you can see there is all our medical wards on one site. And we've got bed number, status of the patient, and then a bit of a a comments box for if if we need to make any comments. And that's, that's the information that we work from. Every two hours we have a bed meeting and um, we have a standard operating procedure now which um, has been a big revelation to us but each person in the patient flow team who runs the bed meetings runs them in exactly the same way and through doing this we've reduced the time taken for bed meetings from maybe 40 or 50 minutes down to 15 minutes and everybody runs the meetings in the same way and there's a set procedure to follow The first thing you do is you allocate patients into empty beds and so it goes on and so it goes on. So we're trying to move people out and then move people into the right place. You might ask why we've not uh, invested in technology and we are actually testing some technology at the moment. Um, But this was a very easy, low-cost thing to do. Um, It's quite wearing on shoe leather for the patient flow. Um, staff because they just constantly walk around the hospital but they're not just collecting data they're interacting with the ward staff at the same time picking up information from them at the same time so this is not a high cost thing to do so that's visual hospital now linked with this is something that should happen on the ward and it's it's called plan for every patient and it literally is what it says on the tin really (coughs) that everybody, every patient, should have a plan, a day-by-day plan of the interventions required to get them to discharge, and that that plan is visual. So this, this should be on the wall. Again, it's on a piece of perspex. Um, so Mr Smith comes into the hospital, um, and the, within 24 hours of him coming into hospital, somebody is developing a plan of those interventions that are required 
And when we've run out of interventions, we've got to ask ourselves, is that the date of discharge? And that's what the Green Triangle is. So we make a plan. And it's a hypothesis, it's a guess, it's a best guess based on what we think will happen, uh, based on what the patient's (coughs) symptoms are when they come into hospital. But the important thing about the the plan is that it needs to be checked. And on a daily basis, um, on Tuesday we'll go back to Monday and say, did we actually do what we said we were going to do? If we didn't do it, do we still need to do it? If we do still need to do it, we need to write it in red because this is an indication that we've not delivered on time and in full and we need to make sure that this does happen today because what we know is if these things don't get done, that just extends length of stay. If we extend length of stay, we expose our patients to all the things that Mark was talking about earlier, uh, healthcare-acquired infections, pressure ulcers, falls, etc., etc., Plus the fact, who wants to be in hospital when they don't have to be in hospital? And this is a plan for every patient on one of our wards. Um, It's early days for us with testing plan for every patient and um, we've been testing it on this particular ward, which is our oncology ward, since the 1st of August this year. Uh, Again, very low tech, but we did have a bit of a brainwave in terms of, um, I don't know know if you can see from this, this picture, but the perspex is in small sections and what the ward was saying was we need to move our patients quite regularly because sometimes we need to get somebody in a side room so we need to move somebody out in that case so if you're telling us we need to wipe everything off this board that's going to cause us problems so we've cut the perspex into strips and they just it's magnetized and they just pull it off the wall and they put it into a different place and that's made a big difference small thing made a big difference to the staff we we even had a conversation yesterday at the master class if somebody's moving ward can we not just take the piece of perspex from one ward to the other So you might see people walking round with bits of perspex (laughs) under their arms. But I think that's for another day. Yeah. So a bit about our results then to date. As Mark said, we've seen a 28% reduction in medical length of stay. And again, this is for patients excluding rehab. And it's quite remarkable. I I always believed in this, but I, I never really believe that we would achieve so much and medical length of stay just keeps on going down and I think the reason it keeps on going down is because yes we're still doing visual hospital but what we're doing is uncovering problems and hopefully dealing with them and all these things are uh, contributing to reducing our length of stay. And an example of this is in, in tackling the green crosses, remember these are the people who are delayed. Uh, Once a week in our hospitals, we do um, a bit of an audit of everybody who's in the hospital and what their length of stay is. And um, we look at patients who've been with us over 30 days, and this is a a chart showing those weekly numbers of patients um, over time. And as you can see, uh, this is in Huddersfield, one of our two sites, you can see the number of patients with a length of stay of 30 days has gone down quite dramatically. Um, and uh, that's because we're tackling the green crosses. These are the patients who, you know, we've had patients in our hospital up to two years, which is, we're acute hospital, it's, it's a bit of a nonsense, but um, that's what can happen with some of the things that, that, that patients have to go through. When we first started doing visual hospital, we didn't know what the green crosses were because we we were aware that we had delays, but we'd never really been looking at them. So what we started to do was try and categorise what the reasons for for delays were. And this is something we do on a daily basis. Um, And this is just a Pareto chart showing five days' worth of occupied bed days, uh, looking at the different reasons for people still being in hospital. And this is last year, about this time last year. And in that five-day period, we had 174 occupied bed days. So these are bed days that shouldn't have been occupied by people because they shouldn't have been with us, that we should have been able to move them on. And of those, 56 or 32% were awaiting a package of care. And we knew it was a big problem, but what I don't think what we realised was how big the problem was, our biggest problem by far. So obviously, we then knew that's the problem we had to start tackling. And through doing visual hospital, what's happened, we've found, is that our relationship with our 
uh, social work colleagues who work in the hospital has, has become much better. Um, we, I think we worked on a bit of an adversarial um, relationship before where it was a bit of a why haven't you done this your fault you need to do this where we've got to now is every day somebody from the social work, work department comes into the patient floor office and spends time going through all the patients and working up the plans what do I need to do what do you need to do who's going to take what action what action has been taken and how can we move these patients on and I've just taken um, another five days worth and this is um, up to the 21st of October this year and with less occupied bed days 133 uh, but only 20 of those are now waiting for package of care so only 15 percent of those it's still the highest but it's not the highest by as many and the reasons we've been able to do this is because we've been able to have some discussions about um, purchasing what we call transitional beds so that we can get people out of the acute hospital into a more suitable environment before they go home and get their home care package delivered. So as Mark said, we've been able to take out over two million in uh, savings from closing over 100 medical beds across the Trust. I think, again, uh, we've probably taken out just a few too many. We're doing an exercise at the moment to try and work out just how many medical beds we do need. Um, we've also seen savings on the use of bank and agency staff of about 60000 a month. And this is because we've, we've redeployed some of our staff when wards have closed. And we've been very lucky that we've not had to have any compulsory redundancies. Uh, we've lost people through natural wastage. We've had a mutually agreed redundancy scheme that we have lost some people through. But nobody has had to be made redundant, which is um, really good at the moment. In terms of plan for every patient, as I say, this is, it's early days yet. We started this on the 1st of August. And these are consecutive discharges from Ward 12, our oncology ward, uh, and length of stay of, of each of those patients. So to the left of the black line you've got before we start at Plan for Every Patient and to the right you've got since then up to the 20th of October. And we've seen a reduction in the mean length of stay of those patients from 5.1 to 4.2 days. And of course this is on top of any gain that we made previously through implementing visual hospitals. So this is really exciting for us. Um, but again early days. So what's next for us then? Uh, a piece of work that we're working on at the moment is about levelling discharges. It's about getting the ward to think about, OK, I have four discharges a day. We know that because we've looked back and seen what they've had historically. And getting to them to think about, well, can we have one of those discharges before 10 o'clock? One at 12, one before 2, one before 4. We're not asking you to have them all in the morning. Let's just have a beat throughout the day. Uh, so we're, it's very early days, but we're just starting some work on that at the moment. Um, we're in the process of spreading plan for every patient across the medical and surgical wards. So we're still working with our oncology ward, but we're testing with two other medical wards in the very, very early stages of them using plan for every patient. And as I said a bit earlier, we're trying um, to look at an accurate calculation of the beds that we require. What do we need in each specialty? And then what do we need overall? And recognising that sometimes the demand will outstrip the supply of beds, so we need to think about, we need a buffer of beds. In the health service, we've traditionally in winter opened a winter ward um, that we've had difficulty staffing, that's sometimes been clinically unsafe. But what we're recognising here is that we're not talking about a winter ward, we're talking about a buffer that we open in a stepwise manner and we close in a stepwise manner as quickly as we can. And what's the escalation for that? What are the steps that precede that? And what's, what are the management actions? And linked with that, and uh, listening to the talks first thing this morning uh, made the cogs uh, grind a bit, but what we're... What we're also doing is looking at what the managers of these services, what's their contribution to operational management? Because we do, in some, some general managers, uh, don't see that operational management is their job. And what we're trying to do is to, to describe a job that does involve operational management and is part of this escalation and patient flow process. So we're working on that at the moment. Um, when, I, when, we, when we spread visual hospital, what we didn't do 
was going to maternity services or paediatric services because they manage their beds separately. They manage their own uh, bed, beds capacity themselves. But maternity services were very interested in looking at visual hospital because they have the same pressures on a smaller basis. So our colleagues in children's and women's services have been doing some work in maternity and I think they're the first area anywhere to be looking at maternity and it's going really well for them even though it's early days yet but really well.